Did you know? I, I love did it. <laughs> you got here. Wonderful. Well, I'm so excited, Raji, because when you agreed to do this talk with me, I was so excited because for many years I've been a huge admirer. And that's what I mean. It's easy to say fan, but I think it's more important if someone's an admirer of you. I hear you. Yeah. yeah, and actually, I consider people like you more of a supporter. Just yeah. a wonderful supporter. <laughs> uh, yeah, because, you know, it's like so nice when you connect, when I connect with people around the world that get me you know they they see yeah. my light and my love and and so i always look at the quote-unquote fans as wonderful supporters yeah that's <laughs> it but just so people will get an idea of um the life event which happened to you and i'll have an interesting question to ask after you introduce people tell people what you became famous for and literally turned your life right around sure sure Okay, so <laughs> the very thing that you may think could be your demise can oftentimes turn into blessings. And um, I went for black market uh, procedures, um, oh God, in like 2003. Uh, I had been on hormones, transitioning, uh, as a trans woman and um, you know, after a while the hormones, they weren't enough. And it was almost like a rite of passage uh, in our community that like the next thing to do after hormones would be to go and get pumped is what we called it. And that's where you went and got black market injections. At the time, the resources for trans people weren't very good. I mean, thank God they've gotten a little better. We still have a long way to go. But, um, you know, it just wasn't many resources. And I always say this, like, a lot of us were rubbing two nickels together to try and transition. And so I went down the road of black market injections. And in the community, uh, there were girls that had gone and got it done. And for the most part, they looked great. You know, beautiful, actually. And also, um, we weren't seeing, at least in my immediate uh, community, I wasn't seeing any adverse reaction. So I had nothing to really gauge it against. And I, I proceeded with what I thought was caution. I asked the um, person if they were using medical grade silicone and they assured me. And so long story short, I ended up getting my face done because I thought, well, let me start with my face because that's usually the first thing people see when you walk out into society is your face. I mean, unless, I guess, unless I'm in some, you know, Muslim country where I have to cover <laughs> up. But, but um, and then after I did my face, which came out, I would say, beautiful. I mean, initially it really looked nice. And then I worked my way down. I did my breasts. I did my hips and my buttocks. And about a year and a half in is when I had the horrible reaction in my face. And that was the beginning of many years of, I would say the beginning of the nightmare because uh, it, I suffered for many years, not only having a disfigured face, but you know, physically it affected me, but also I suffered mentally, spiritually, because I also say this, it's hard enough being a trans woman, try being a trans woman with a very disfigured face. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went, you know, I continued with my activism because I've been an activist for like about 25 years now, but it was not easy. And I was dealing with a lot. And then in 2011, my story went viral. Mm -hmm. And literally overnight, my story went all over the world. And that led to me being on about 35 different TV shows worldwide. Either I was on it or they featured me. And then that led to me being on reality TV. Um, so it's amazing, like the very thing that I thought would be my demise ended up turning into an opportunity yeah. 
for me to do my activism on such a global level. And then on top of it, I was eventually able through botched on the e-network to get some corrective surgery on my face. I'm, it, it'll never be perfect, I, but I think I've come a long way compared to the oh. way I used to look. Yeah. Well, this it, Rachi, and um, you, uh, when I first saw you, said to you, we're on the Trisha show, if I remember rightly. And I remember you saying at the time, that you felt that this was sort of like turned into an opportunity by spiritual forces or fate that you'd yeah. go down a completely different road. Because the question I have, though, is you saw which you are now and you were described on Botched as being a cuddly teddy bear when you thought they wanted to cuddle. Now, what were you like as a person before this happened? What's different about you now compared to well, that? So I believe that we all come to the planet with gifts, you know, with things that are just unique about our own individual selves. And we bring an individual unique light to the planet. And one of the things that I've always had, and I'm so grateful to God universe for having it is an optimistic spirit about me. Um, I've always had that going through all the different hard times that I've gone through. I think it was the thing that really saved my life. Um, believing that there's something greater uh, mm -hmm. than myself. Um, n believing that each and every one of us are here for a purpose. And even in moments where I felt like I couldn't go on and that I didn't belong here on the planet because of being ostracized by society and going through all of that, I still had this thing inside of me that said, no, 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 your life also has meaning and purpose. Yeah. And you are here for a reason. And so I held on to that. And, um, I would say that the thing that shines the most about me, because I remember when I was on my first season on Botched, and even on the Trisha show, they had me back three times yeah. uh, on that show, is my, my, my persona, the mm -hmm. person that I am, like what I am from inside, like my personality, my essence. And I remember when I did the first season on Botch, I got so many messages from people all around the world. They, they weren't able to do any surgery at that time. And every so many people were saying, but you're still beautiful, Raji. Yeah. You're yeah. so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I knew that what they were seeing was the beauty of my spirit. Yeah. I tell you now, Raji, right? Let's say um, this is what I always say. How many times, this if people want to know about uh, what's more important, beauty on the inside or beauty on the outside, how many times have you seen a man, Raji, and you thought, whoa, oh, I'd marry him and live with him forever. I'd go woof, woof and go down on all fours for him. But ah! yeah, <laughs> but yeah, right. <laughs> but when you get to know them, Oh, it's a turn-off because the personality, yet you'll meet someone you wouldn't give a set look to, and then you start talking to them, and they're the most beautiful person. The looks just disappear. The spirit takes over. That's what I you always are, Oh, my God. What you say is so powerful, and it's so true. It's kind of like that nice, juicy red apple that looks nice on the outside, and then you bite into it, and it's rotten. Yeah. And, or, you know, my mom always says, never judge a book by its cover. And that is so true. I've met some really handsome guys. They were drop dead gorgeous. Yeah. And, you know, again, like I love when you said I, you get on all fours and go. Roof, roof. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, totally, uh, I totally know what you mean. Uh, but then when you get to know them, the, the person that they are is so ugly. Yeah. And, and so. You know, so yeah, you're, and then the opposite. I totally agree with you. 
you meet someone, oh, you're not really attracted to them physically. But mm. then after you get to know them, it's like, oh, my God. Something comes from within them. And it's the personality that changes them. And it's not that the looks don't matter. They become beautiful in your eyes. And that's the power of the personality doing that. And it is. It's it is. Else that's doing it. But yet, so looks are just such a, a superficial thing. And of course, I used to have friends years ago, um, and she was like a model. She wasn't a model, but she was. She could have been a model. Oh, she was uh -huh. stunning, absolutely stunning. And we used to be having no talks about men in her life and all this. She used to. I don't know what was going on in her head, but she used to pick some red corkers. And I said to her, I said, you know, I said, the thing is, because I was never considered good looking. And I used to say, you know, I'd say, I'd just like to know what it would be like. And she said, you know what she said, the horrible thing is, she said, I know these men and these relationships aren't massing. She said, because of one thing, I know that they only interested me of inside the bedroom and, that, and to show me off to the friends. She said, I've never met a man Yet, she said, who I thought this man loves me for me. And the problem with it wasn't the truth, and it was Raji. She was horrible to her partners, horrible. So wow. it certainly wasn't a personality they were going for. It wasn't. But she said, so she said, it may look like I've got everything because of me looks, but she said, it happens. She said, I'd just love to know and relax and say, because she said, the thing that goes through your head as well, because she had children. She said, all right, my looks are okay now, but I'm going to start losing my looks as I get older. Are they going to still be with me? If you look at some of the most beautiful movie stars, if they were blessed enough to live a long life, the beauty, the physical beauty, eventually it was gone. Yeah. And so that is so true. And I, I've had discussions with women about this, like even as you start to get older and you maneuver in the world and you see that, like, um, I remember speaking to one of my therapists actually about this and she was like, you know, she says, getting older as a woman, it, it's an adjustment in the sense that guys don't, you don't get the attention from guys that you used to and you're kind of like um, maybe a little overlooked and, she was in her 60s at the time, like her early 60s. And she was saying that it was like a shift that happened as she got into her 60s. She noticed that men started treating her different. And, you know, she wasn't over the top go gorgeous as far as mm -hmm. physically, but she was, a, you know, like a, 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 an attractive woman. Um, she put herself together well. And I think this is just the thing across the board for people with when you're aging because um my mom recently i was on the phone with her and she had gone somewhere and she was complaining about how people want to dismiss you when you're older you know my yeah. mom god bless her she turned 80 last month and my mom still looks really good for her age but she was talking about the whole ageism thing and i think that is really connected to physical looks and like yeah. how as you no matter who you are where you come from what you are what you have as our body ages our physicality changes yeah that's it so and that's what you and especially in the modern world that's what you're judged by but i say personality again is so important and this is where it comes into a um, play with you raju because you've got a magnetic personality in other words Oh. You watch your videos, you see it, and you think, this person I would love to be at my party. If I had a party, oh. I'd be like, I want Raji to come along <laughs> because I could sit back and say, no, Raji, go on, <laughs> keep everyone oh. happy. I don't have to do it. But uh, yeah, so it is the personality. Now, also, what I want to touch on is the transition as well, because as you said before, it was difficult enough transitioning. But then this happened. Now, you're from Florida. And yeah. yeah. I, I Go ahead. I know where, I think I know where yeah. you're going with this. <laughs> was it because I know that 
different place it can be more difficult to actually transition where I live, which is Liverpool. It would be very, 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 very difficult, almost dangerous to walk around in certain areas of this city um, as a trans woman or a trans man for that matter. So did you have that against your, was it more liberal there? Yeah, okay, so I would say for most of my life, I have felt like I've been in a bit of a gender war. That's how I describe it. Because I never lived up to the expectations of what society placed on me by being declared as male. Yeah, I never could live up to that. Um, from four years old, they were calling me faggot and sissy at four. And I remember, like, it was just yesterday, looking up at one of my neighbors, Mr. Pembleton. He was a, a fireman. All the kids loved to, like, hang out by his garage. And, and um, I remember looking up at him and saying, Mr. Pembleton, what does faggot mean? And he looked down at me and he says, why on earth are you asking me that question? And I said, well, that's what all the kids are calling me. And he never answered the question. He did say to me, you don't pay attention to what those kids are saying. And I knew based on his reaction, whatever faggot meant couldn't be a, a quote unquote good yeah. thing. And that was at four years old. So as I got into school, you know, the bullying was relentless. Um, not only was I being picked on because of, um, you know, me not being a boy, <laughs> me not acting like a, the way a boy should act. I was pretty effeminate, uh, but also the fact that I'm multiracial, so I looked different. Um, you know, the black kids were like, well, what are you? They weren't accepting me and I wasn't uh, fitting in with the white kids, you know? So it was like the, also that um, piece of like the identity in regards to like my ethnicity. And so the two together was like a double whammy. And, you know, now there's a lot more mixed people in the world. So, you know, we're talking like back in the, in like the early seventies and, yeah. So it wasn't as many as much mixing then. And so as a, a, a you know, mixed kid, you, you oftentimes did stand out. But I grew up in Philadelphia and I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in Philadelphia, which is about two hours away from New York. And it's also a, a pretty big city. Um, but, you know, back in those days, even to be gay, like mm -hmm. you didn't have like when I hear people today talk about, oh, you know, LGBTQ support groups in school. I was like, what? In my day, there was none of that, you know? No. And, and I always say too, that, you know, we didn't have computers then. So you couldn't go and Google, what does it mean when you're a boy, but you feel like a girl? Like you were pretty much in your insulated communities. You went to school, you came home. And so I did know early on that I was probably gay. I, mm -hmm. I knew that much, that I was like an effeminate gay guy uh, or boy. And then as I got older and got into, you know, high school and in high school, I became, I was still the faggot, but I became the popular faggot because I was in, you know, on debate team and on the choir or in the choir, I was um, volunteering at the community hospital. I was dancing on a show called Dance Party USA, which was similar to like bandstand back in the um, 50s and 60s, but it was like an 80s version. Um, and so I got pretty popular from that, but it was still the stigma, like, oh yeah, you know, they're, they're gay. And it wasn't until I got into my early 20s that I really started to connect the dots because I was like going to gay clubs and I was seeing, tr starting to see transgender people. And then I started to think about like what I did when I was younger. Like for instance, you know, the basketball my dad got me, I wasn't playing basketball with it. I would go in my room and put it under my t-shirt and walk around like I was pregnant and I'd have the baby 
and in my mind, you know, I was imagining yeah. it. And I, you know, I'd be a good mama taking care of my baby. And G.I. Joe dolls, they used to get given to the little boys back then. He was never going to war. He was always coming home to me. And I was, <laughs> you know, I was yeah. being a good wife and taking care of him. And then when I got into my early teens and the hormones started raging and, you know, you start to fantasize sexually in my fantasies, I always pictured myself with breasts and a vagina, yeah. but I didn't even realize I was doing it. It was just so second nature. And so in the early twenties is when I started to connect the dots and I thought, Hmm, I'm probably not gay. I'm probably trans. And I also realized too, when I was connecting with gay men, it wasn't, it didn't feel like a good connection in the sense of like, they were always trying to butch me up and yeah. it just felt awkward. It was always the straight men in the neighborhood that were making passes at me and, you know, trying to get with me sexually. So all of those things, kind of, you know, came together. And um, that's when I decided, you know, well, I started living as androgynous. Uh, yeah. Back then we called it androgynous, but it's uh, nowadays it's called gender non-conforming, non-binary. And there's a big movement, which is wonderful. But yeah. I always say back in the day when I was doing it, they were throwing bottles at me, you know? Yeah. And, um, because people want to be able to label and um exactly right yeah. yeah so i did that for a few years and then i realized you know it wasn't enough and that's when i started to transition um but yeah always feeling like i've never you know even though i was born and they labeled me as male i never could live up to the what it means to be quote unquote what it means to be a male in the world and um, even when I was living before I transitioned, you know, people, it was like they saw it right away because it's an essence, you know, yeah. it's an essence. It's the way you sit. It's the way you gesture. It's the way you, you express yourself, the way you walk, the way you talk. It's an essence. You yeah. know, I think you know, just putting on a dress doesn't make you a woman, you know, it's, it's a whole thing. That's a good point you've just uh, said there, Raji, because there's a debate. I don't know where it's going on. I'm uh, uh, sure it will be going on in America as well. But there's this, you know, self-diagnosed trans women who really, if you look at them, you think they're not even trying to look what we think of as a woman. They're not feminine. They're just men yeah. saying, I'm a woman. And they'll put on a dress or something. Well, this is upsetting a lot of uh, women because cis women, now I know I'll talk about this as well, they don't like being called cis women, but we have to have labels and we were given labels by um, the straight communities and all that, so they can exactly. have the labels. Exactly. Yeah, Hello? Yeah. Hello? I say that all the time. I'm like, oh, you don't like being called, called cis? Well, yeah. I didn't like being called a faggot. Or yes, a, that's it. You, you, you know what I like mean? it back. Yeah, now that this is what I've always said, now that LGBTQI people are starting to like say no, we're a part of society, and we've got the power also to make a distinction. If you're going to be called a trans woman, if I'm going to be called intersex, guess what? To differentiate, I'll call you a cis man, yes. or a cis woman, and you'll just have to live with that because we've had to have your labels thrown on us. But women, and I can understand a lot of women getting upset by this when what is someone that basically when you look at them for all intents and purposes is a physical male puts on the dress and says, oh, I'm a woman. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem so uh, right. So but it just doesn't, it seems more, well, in the past we would have turned around and said, oh, you're a uh, transvestite if you're yeah. a man does that. But it's getting, I, because I'm only a few years older than you, Raji, and I remember the 70s. And that's when we first started hearing about trans, and they say transsexual back then, they didn't say trans yeah. to men or women. And we started hearing about trans women. And 
the amazing thing about it was, was back then it was much, much simpler. To be a trans woman, you had to go through a process. You had to be yeah. diagnosed with it and you were expected to go through gender reassignment as well. And if you didn't, you wouldn't be considered a um, trans woman. But now the definition, they've taken the word, especially trans, and they've applied it to things I would never have recognised as being in the trans label. I thought, well, what that's trans. You've even got things like now trans age. Yeah. And it's, like, it's getting really difficult to keep up with now. <laughs> but it, it, do you feel that, though, that years ago it was easier? This is a trans woman, <laughs> and you knew yeah. what to expect, but now... It's sort of broad and that wide that it's getting better. Yeah. And it's easy to insult people as well without no meaning it. Yeah, I totally, and I get it when people say, oh my God, like all these labels, like, come on. I, I, can, I can understand someone getting frustrated over that. Um, I am all for people living their authentic self, whatever that may mean. I'm all for that. Mm. But I do feel that the lines have, have blurred now and there are people that want to, to, to walk with the trans banner, you know, and say, oh, or declare that, that they're transgender, but they're not going through the process. Mm. They're not doing the things that really need to be done. And so it, there's a lot of controversy in the community over that. I um, was going to a group, this was a few years back, and there were people in the group that were coming and they were saying, uh, they were attending the group and, you know, they were saying, oh, that they're trans women. But like, I understand you have to, it's something that starts inside and then little by little you bring it on the you bring it out on the outside like you match the way your outside looks as best as you can with the way you feel inside so i was a woman on the inside before i became a woman on the outside uh, a trans woman that is on the outside and um i understand that things take time but a lot of these people were coming every week and they were like complaining and, and like wallowing in the fact that they're trans women and they want to be recognized as that, but as that, but meanwhile, they had hair on their chest yeah. and they had beards and mustaches and they weren't even like trying to paint their nails or, you know, what I'm trying to say is like, you have to make an effort. Yeah. Like, and, and, and that's what we all did as trans people when, I, you know, back in my day, you know, you started slow, you painted your nails and maybe you grew your hair out. And I mean, it's a process and it doesn't happen overnight. But at the same time, you can't sit and wallow in, 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 your, in your misery about the fact that you're not being recognized as a trans woman, but then you're not doing anything to work towards that. Yeah, that's it. And that's where I say it was easier years ago. The definition was much, much restricted. But now it's also opened up. And I say I respect anyone because I'm more or less, because people always think, and this way I get it, people always think I'm transgender. And I get caught. They think they'd insult me by saying, and the man, and the man. And it's like, I know my man. I'm a, apparently, this is it, Raji, if you wear makeup, that means that you want to be a woman. Yeah. So <laughs> David Bowie wants to be a woman. Yeah. You know, all those people back then, all the Georgian generals that were fighting on the um, battlefield, the British Georgian generals with the wigs and the makeup. Yes, and yes. Women, you know, they, you just have to sort of think, oh, they will pat them out on the head and think, oh, you should have concentrated more in school and you'd be more intelligent. Yeah. But I'd say that I'm more or less, when I view myself, I'd say that I'd fit under the label of non-binary mm -hmm. because I don't care whether people see me as a man or a woman. It's up to the individual that's looking on to me. <laughs> if I had me dream, and I've always said this, if my dream was to come true, I would have been born a female. Because okay. like you've just said, your thoughts that you have inside your head are all, everything about me is geared towards female. But the strange thing is, this is it, 
as I grew up and started getting older, and I could have gone for a um, for reassignment treatment and uh, way back in the eighties, I could have done it, and I pulled back because I thought I'm not sure here. And the thing that made me pull back, Raji, was you know thought, what? I'm sorry to interrupt. For some reason, the volume just went down. I'm wondering if I should call back and we so I can get a better connection. I'll call you right back. Yeah, that's fine. Right okay, because I want to hear everything you're saying. Yeah. So I'll call you right back. Technology, me lovelies. Yeah, that's right, Kelsey, you too. Um, the lines are getting too blurred, and that's what's scaring people. Because we all, as humans as well, like the assurance of knowing that, you know, things are in the right place, things are where they should be and all this business, if you know what I'm saying. And if you're not sure that, well, it's like looking at a new species, a human, isn't it? And you're thinking, could it be dangerous? Could it? Yeah, am I safe and all this business? That's what you start thinking. Also, do you know, dear, I'd say to you, it depends on the area you're in. I think the hate towards trans people has got worse now than what it ever was. It's always been bad, but I think it's gone much worse now. And I see it on um, thing, you know, on social media. And it's horrific. They hate that because I get it because people think I'm transgender. I get it thrown at me the same hate. That's why I'm very supportive of trans people because I get the same hate they receive. But now, I, from what I remember in the seventies, unless I was going and the eighties, unless I'm going around with me eyes closed uh, back then, it wasn't as the hatred was there, but it wasn't as bad. Hello again. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh. It just the volume went so low. And I know that happens sometimes because I'm on my phone actually. And sometimes if someone's like trying to call, for some reason it connect it 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 kicks it into it's like so, a low yeah. a low volume. Yeah. Yeah. So what were you so what were you saying? I because I, I was just, I was just saying that when I was saying, you know, I could have gone in the eighties for okay. reassignment treatment, but I would have had to give up my job, which I trained for all my life, which was a ballet dancer, and that was pulling me off. I thought I didn't want to give up that after all that training since I was a child. But when it was there, and we, I was talking with the doctor about it, psychiatrist about it, and he started telling me, he said, well, what do you want? He said, what do you expect will happen? So I said, don't know. But you see, I was half-hearted into it, Raji. And I said, um, I said, maybe I said, I'll, um, I'll, well, I said, I'll be a woman. Or I'll be, my body will be female. And he said, no, it won't. And I said, well, he said, it won't. He said, what it will be, he said, you'll be made to look externally like a woman. But he said, I can assure you, he said, you won't have a woman's body. He said, you can get breasts. He said, that will be breasts. You can grow them. Uh, but he said, the other surgery, he said, you've got to get real stress. And remember what he said to me, Reggie, very interesting. He said, I've known more people, he said, to have this surgery and then end up on a mortuary slab because oh. they were expecting something else. He said, if you think you have problems now, he said, expect it to uh, go a hundredfold. He said, if you go through with this, because he said, you'll get such bigotry. And that's well, also made me stop. And you know, and 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 in those days, a lot of what he said was so true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can totally understand that. And even I'll tell you, I joke with some of my trans girlfriends. I'm like the ones that have bottom surgery, um, I, I, that have had the sexual reassignment surgery. I tell them, "Oh, you mean that cul-de-sac that you have?" Because. <laughs> 
you know, and, and one of my girlfriends, she cracks up because she had the bottom surgery and she's like, yeah, it leads to nowhere. Like it's, it's just a cul-de-sac. Yeah. And so, so, you know, what he said it, in many ways, yeah, he was correct. Like you can't, you, we trans women will never be cisgendered women. That's just mm -hmm. the reality of it. But at the same time, I don't consider myself a man either. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's this, it's, I guess, for lack of a better phrase or word, it's kind of like this middle zone. Yeah. And, and, you know, cultures around the world, there are cultures that have, for, you know, for, since the beginning, have acknowledged that quote unquote middle zone. Because even in Fiji, they have women, men, and then they have what they call the third gender, the Fahafafinas. Yeah. So, you know, gender, that binary, I think in many ways has always been fluid. It's just that now it's even becoming more like, yeah. you know, because of all the different identities. And, and like I said, I'm all for people being there, living their authentic truth. I'm all for that. Uh, but at the same time, too, you know, you need to, I think people need to kind of respect people that have been in the, I'll, I'll call it the game, like we older trans people have like led the way in, in, for our, you know, movement, if you will. And then like to have people come in, young folks and say, oh, well, I'm trans and I'm this and that. But we're like, well, wait a minute, you didn't do you didn't go through like the steps, like mm. you're, you're, and, and listen, you can call yourself whatever you want. Like, yeah. you know, like I said, Hey, if you want to sit and say you're this and that and the other, but there's something to say for lived experience. Exactly. And, you know, and what you've been through and, you know, it's interesting what you said. I'm wondering if that, that, psychologist that you went to or psychiatrist had told you the opposite if your trajectory would have been different like if you would have gone for it do you know that's the I, I say i would have left it until uh, much later because i wanted my career and i would have had to give up my career if i'd gone down that route but i would have considered it later Wait. but when it got to the point where i could have I thought, yeah. I sat down and I started to try to work out what exactly are my feelings and what exactly is a man and a woman to me. And then I thought, do you know, I thought, I don't like being male, which I don't. But at the same time, Raji, when I'm talking to someone, I get on much better with men than I do socially, than I do with women. And there's something, and I thought, there's something there that I don't understand about women. Or just yeah. put that block there. And then I thought, do I want to be a woman? And the realisation was only if I could be a fully functioning woman. In other words, I was born one. That's yeah. the only time. And I thought, I'm yeah. going to go down a disastrous road here if I do this. And also, I wouldn't have been convinced. I couldn't have passed very well and I know couldn't have and I could where you've had to put up with hate and I've seen the hate that trans people I get that hate because people think I'm trans I would have really struggled to cope with that really really struggled yeah sometimes I sit here you know in my life and I think God how did I make it through because it was hard it was hard I mean when I see the younger trans generation and even the young, the, the, you know, with the non-binary gender non-conforming uh, conforming movement, I, I'm happy because it shows progress. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I will see a young trans girl and I smile and think, well, maybe she won't have to go through as hard as I went through. Like maybe it won't have to be as rough yeah. for her as it was for me and you know isn't that what it's all about trying to make it better for the next generation you know make it make you know make the world a better place than yeah. the way you found it and so in that regard I, I'm happy about that 
um, that, you know, we have seen some progression, although we still have a long way to go. And I go out and about in society and, you know, things have gotten better where I don't feel like, oh my God, like I'm always on stage and I'm always being a spectacle, where, whereas I used to feel that way. But still, I'm out sometimes and I have my moments where I run into ignorant people that, you know, aren't very nice. And, you know, this whole thing of like passing and not passing, I have had discussions about this with um, other trans people. And, you know, if you choose to live you know, your life stealth and pass, hey, more power to you. Yeah. And that's your choice. But I always say this, people that don't pass or choose not to pass are the ones that make the movement go forward. Yeah. I think what Ailsa say, it's a new world that's being evolved and young yeah. people as well. Mm. are starting to have a voice in a way that we never had a voice. Never had. And, yeah. and people go on about now, which can be scary and you have to, you get alarmed. You know, this trend that's going on of women removing the breasts so that they'll be non-binary. Why that has to make you non-binary yeah. removing breasts, I don't know. But um, they're getting the breasts taken away. And of course, that's irreversible. You can't easily... Get, well, you won't, can't get them back, can you? Yeah. And they seem very young when they're doing it. It seems to be becoming, in some instance, a fashion accessory. And yeah. it's like, that's where the danger. But as I say, if they do it and it goes wrong, they have to take, accept that it was their decision to do it yeah. and not say, oh, this should be banned, this should be stopped. No, they've done it. Um, and it's a life lesson, basically. Like, I, this is the interesting thing about you, Raj, which I thought was absolutely amazing. Now, the Duchess who did these procedures on you, you never actually uh, reported it or tried to prosecute it, did you? You didn't. Yeah. She, what was the thing you said? Just tell people why you wouldn't prosecute her. Yeah, sure. Um, the detectives and the, pol the police basically were looking at me like, you know, you're not going to, you don't want to prosecute, you know, and I, my whole thing was, first of all, I felt I had to take some responsibility for exactly. making, yes, mm -hmm. for making the decision to go to her and have the black market injections done. Mm -hmm. And granted, she did lie and tell me that it was um, medical grade silicone. So I went in being deceived, but still, I made the decision as an adult to do that. And I felt like that was some responsibility that, that fell on me. I had to take that responsibility. And secondly, I thought if I'm going to exert my energy in this, why not spend it advocating and doing my mm -hmm. activism and, you know, doing the whole media thing and letting people know about what happened to me, hopefully educating people about it, hopefully maybe even saving some lives yeah. as opposed to exerting energy to go through a court trial and see her prosecuted. Because there's a part of me that I have to say feels a little sorry for her. I remember you crying when she was released from prison and she contacted you, didn't you? And you were crying, which I yes, think was amazing. I, yeah, I... Um, yeah, there's a part of me that, that um, does feel sorry for her. I mean, I know we trans women have it hard, and I know she certainly had her hard roads to go down. And um, I just feel like, you know, there's power in forgiveness. Yeah. There really is. And um, I hope that both of us learned from this and, like, she can – She's in actually in prison now because there were other people that wanted to prosecute. Yeah. And so she's in prison now. But, you know, she'll be out in a few years, hopefully, and she'll come out and, and maybe do some wonderful things in her life. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I think that everyone, we all are living this life. And, yes, we all make mistakes. We all do things that maybe we regret. But there's always an opportunity to turn things around. Yeah. And um, 
And so, yeah. So I, you know, I wish her well. I wish her well. And, and, um, you see, that's where, Rachi, that's where you're such a blessed being of light you are. I couldn't have done what you just said there. I couldn't have. And you know what? I feel guilty knowing that you can do it. I feel guilty that I can't do that. And I think that's your special gift. You make people sit back. And people like you that have gone through great, I mean, when you think of all the horrific things that people go through, and they literally keep everything real and then go to forgiveness after it's been a horrendous journey. And that's the message you give to people. And that's why I wanted to talk to you because I thought this is a message of, guess what? You too can be liberated by letting go. Because look, if you hadn't have done that, Raji, you wouldn't be the person you are now. You wouldn't. You wouldn't, darling. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for saying that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I, I've been through such hard times, but yeah. I know that I'm also very blessed. And I know that I could have died. I mean, I, you know, this thing could have killed me. And, um, and I'm so grateful that I still have life, um, mm -hmm. that I've been able to use my story to touch so many yeah. people. And I don't take those things for granted. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't take those things for granted at all. And that's it, because also when you, you know, were on um, the phone to Terry Dubrow's mama, and you were saying thank you to her for, you know, giving birth to him so he could help people. The same is true of you. Thank you to your mama for giving birth to you because yeah. you are a being of light, Raj. Oh. You're amazing, amazing. And I interview people who have really made big, big changes to their life, you know, where they've come from by being really serious drug addicts into all sorts and they've decided no we have to change and the message they bring to the world helps everyone yeah. and as i say beings of light or earth angels is another way that we say earth angels so if that person is saying here we are so you're a blessed we're blessed wow. as well to have you we are we're wow. blessed it, to have you. it's people like you that inspire me to keep going oh. i swear your your ego stroking me thank you so <laughs> much to me. no it's but it's so so true, and I'm just on. I say I'm on a high because I'm speaking to because I never thought, isn't it? And this is nothing the internet can be a nightmare, but isn't it wonderful that we can do this now? When I first saw you, I thought there's no chance I'm ever going to meet this person and talk to this person, and yet now look at because of technology we can talk, it's a blessing, it, isn't it? It is, it is. I always say, like, you know, we as, as, as um, human beings on the planet. We've evolved and we've literally gone from the caves to the computers. And it is, you know, like with everything, there's good and bad about it. But one of the wonderful things about technology is that you can sit all the way across the world. And I can sit here in, you know, South Florida. And, you know, we are able to like connect and have a conversation. And yeah. so that, that is just absolutely amazing. Oh, it's absolutely amazing that we can do that. Now, if you, this is what I always ask everyone I speak to, I want you to imagine that you're looking at your younger self and you're about going on to where we become. And I say, I reckon when we're 12, that's when we start evolving our identity where we're going to go out into the world and be ourselves. If you saw your 12-year-old self now, what three things would you say to them? Oh, my gosh. It's a difficult one. It is. Um, I would tell them that I love them. Mm. I would tell them that they're beautiful, despite what everyone is, what, what a lot of people are saying. And I would tell them that Although the road will be rough and they will go through a lot of difficult times, there will be blessings that will yeah. be 
given to them along the way. Mm -hmm. And they'll be able to one day sit and look back and realize how blessed they are. Yeah. That's that's beautiful. It is because as I say, we don't and when we're growing up this thing we don't realise we live in the moment, don't we? We really don't realise that at any moment things can change. But another question I'd like to ask you, Raji, if you could go back, would you change if you could change what was happening would you change you walking into that pump and party and having that done to you and if and would you what person would you be today if you changed it decided to change everything that we are in this moment everything that we've gone through makes us who we are in this moment everything that we've gone through and I, when I think about that, I just, although I, I suffered so much, it's almost like all the blessings that I've had and all the opportunities I've had to connect with beautiful people around the world like you and to touch so many people in like wonderful, uplifting ways. And, you know, I, I mean, it's just the list goes on and on. I wouldn't have probably been able to do that if exactly. I had So it's almost like, no, I, I guess I'd have to say no. Yeah, that's it. You wouldn't be the Raji you are today. That's for sure. Yeah. You'd be a different person. And that's why I say suffering does to some people, not all people, but does give a light to them where they can go and actually make changes. And that's why... I said when I'm talking to people who gave up drugs, they go out and they're determined to try and help others and say, here we are, this is what you do to try and get your life on track and get it right, which I think is totally vital to do. Now, what kind of work are you doing now, Raji? Because you're a campaigner. You're also an actress, aren't you? Yeah. I can't forget that. <laughs> what? Well well, you know what's ironic? When I was walking around with my disfigured face, like, you know, my very disfigured face, it's still a little disfigured, but not as, as much as it was. But when I was walking around, you know, I thought my hopes of like being on TV and acting and, you know, doing uh, different things were, were shot because I went to uh, um, performing arts high school uh, I went, I did a dual um, study where I, I had dual major. I, I did uh, arts and humanities and I did health sciences. And so I, um, I just thought like, you know, that it wouldn't happen. It would not happen for me. And then fast forward to now, I've been in about one, two, three, four movies. I've been featured on about 35 or maybe a little more TV shows worldwide. You know, my me and my story. Um, and I've had, I, I've re I wrote a memoir, a book uh, called Beyond Face Value. Uh, I'm doing activism in so many ways. I currently work for Trans Social, which is a trans led trans-focused organization. I'm an outreach advocate for, for them. So, like, that's why I said in the beginning of the interview, the very thing that you may think may be your demise or could be your demise can turn into blessings. And there's something to that saying, out of evil cometh good. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Out of evil cometh good, that's it. And you need something. And you don't see the light or you don't notice the light unless the dark is there. Yeah. Oh. You've got to, yeah. You need the dark to see the light. That's yes. what you need, yeah. Oh, so it's so, so true. That. But um, as for acting, I had me chances, but, um, oh, I used to say, Raji, I used to say, I can't act. My God, I used to try it and I'd, 
It would only be, let's put it this way, it would have to be a John Walters film because that's the only my acting style I could do. It couldn't do anything serious. <laughs> and some are oh, some. Hey, but hey, but you'd still be acting. <laughs> oh, yeah, it'd still be acting. Oh, my God, that would have been a dream come true. A John Waltz film with Divine, it would be amazing. Yes. But, but anyway, Raji, it's been wonderful talking to you. And I'm going to have you on again if you'll bless me with that. Oh, uh, sure. It was an p- absolute pleasure speaking with you. And I feel like I wish I could, like, say, let's go out to eat yeah. and, you know, and, like, just have a good time, have a good dinner and enjoy each other as each other's company. Because I feel like even though this is the first time we've connected in, you know, on, like, video, I feel like I've known you. Like, yeah. you feel you're, you just... You're like a familiar spirit to me. Yeah, because that's it. And I feel the same way about you. I think you're absolutely amazing, Raji. And thank you for all people who um, have been watching and joining in. I'll definitely be in contact again, Raji. And I'll be watching close everything you're doing. So, and if you ever want to contact me, contact me, darling. Because I'll be oh, made thank you. So, and thank you to your mama again for giving birth to you so that. So you give her that message from me because I will she gave, tell her. Yes, she gave I will. the world. Yeah, she <laughs> gave the world an earth angel. She did when we got Raji. Oh uh, my so. god, that is so beautiful. I will let her know. I will talk oh, to her okay. later, and I'll give her your message. <laughs> oh, well, so take care, Raji. God bless. God bless you. Keep shining bright, sweet soul. Oh, will do, darling. You keep shining take bright. Care now. Take care. Okay.